All right, everybody. <clears throat> it's four o'clock, and um, I wish you all welcome to this <clears throat> book launch that will mark or celebrate the beginning of the the Hana thing, two thousand twenty-two. The book looks like this, and uh, <clears throat> I guess there is always room for new books in this cruel world. And today we're definitely celebrating another one and i think it's the very first one of its its kind in the anthology stronger together sweden and finland on the road towards nato it, it's produced from by the swedish think tank Frivard and the german konrad adenauer stiftung and we are about to learn how membership will affect finland and sweden but also how it will affect nato of course, we know the background. On May the 18th, a historic period came to an end and a new one began. Finland and Sweden decided to finally apply for NATO membership after 28 years of partnership with NATO, originally partnership for peace, and then eventually later with enhanced opportunities. With uh, Finland and Sweden as new NATO members, we are facing a completely new security situation in the Northern Europe. Never before, so many Western countries have been together in the same defense alliance. The five Nordic countries will now, now be united in NATO. Remember, that's not the case in the European Union. That's not the case in the European Monetary Union, the EMU. But that will be the case now in NATO. This will affect much more than the Swedish and Finnish national defense and security policy. It will also affect, have, have an impact on the whole of NATO. The chapters in this brand new book explore questions such as how Finland and Sweden will contribute to the alliance uh, in a military way, what specialization the new countries may get, what conclusions we can draw, from previous enlargements, how Finland and Sweden will view NATO's nuclear deterrence, and how Finland and Sweden can contribute to NATO regarding, for instance, hybrid threats. After these teasers, it's time to give the floor to the writers of those chapters, or rather those writers who have the possibility to be present here today. We have, unfortunately, some <clears throat> late-minute illnesses but we're used to that uh, in these circumstances. And after the writers have presented their chapters for about five minutes, I will moderate the discussion about the topics. And then, of course, it's also, also going to be possible for the audience to, to put some, some questions into the debate. My name is Stefan Wallin. I'm former Minister for Defense in Finland, and it's a great pleasure for me to moderate this discussion. Um, first of all, well, maybe I'd like to, to present the, the writers and please ask you to come, come forward. Uh, Anne-Sophie Dahl, welcome, who is an Associate Professor of International Relations and non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And she's the author of several books, and I guess the most recent one is NATO Historian om en försvarsallians i förändring. Maybe he could... Yeah, because of that. Karlis Neretniks, member of the Swedish Royal Academy of War Sciences and was previously president of the Swedish National Defense College, a mayor general, General Mayor. That's the case. Stefan Fors, who is a uh, uh, docent of the Finnish Defense College, has also been an active. Uh, participant in the public debate, public discussion and security matters for many, many years. Welcome. Teja Tilikainen, Director of the European Centre of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. And previously she was uh, the Director of the Finnish Institute for International Affairs. Welcome. We also have here, you might 
you don't have to to come forward yet. Uh, Gabriela Bauman, who is the head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, Nordic Projects, and as a reminder, Konrad Adenauer was, of course, the first German Bundeskanzler between 1949 and 1963, end of historical lesson. And then Jörg See, who is um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Defense Policy and Planning at NATO, has also promised to comment the discussions we are about to hear today. And at first, I would like to, to invite Gabriel Baumann from the Stiftung's point of view to, to say some words before we start our, our presentations of the chapters. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And we are really very pleased to be here today and to have the opportunity uh, to launch the book, which has been initiated by, by Free, World, Free World Forum and the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. And I think we did it quite timely still in June, just a month after Finland and Sweden applied for membership. And we thought we should do it fast in order to, to really get the perspective perspectives of, of um, experts from the Nordic countries and also from Germany to say, what, how, can, how can Finland and Sweden contribute to NATO and uh, what they can uh, and how we can better understand also uh, the strategic thinking of Finland and Sweden, the capabilities and the security culture. So um, that's finally the book. It was released, has been released uh, last, uh, last Friday. Um, we had a, we had a pre-launch in, in Stockholm. We also had uh, speakers there to present uh, some of the findings. So I'm very happy to be here today in order to present the final results and to have four speakers out of eight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Gabriele. And now it's time to proceed to our panelists. And we will start with Anne-Sophie Dahl. You could come here if you want to, or you can speak for, okay. Thank you, Stefan, and they, can you hear me? Yes. And thank you to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and to Freeward, and it's always great to be back in, in, uh, in Helsinki. My chapter in the book is about uh, the previous enlargement and the lessons that we can draw from the previous enlargements, how this round of enlargements compare compares to uh, the previous ones, and we've had lots of many rounds of enlargements prior to this one. First of all, we might think of this as a very long process, and we are impatiently waiting for this to come to an end for Hungary and Turkey to finally ratify the, uh, the, uh, the applications. But it has actually been an exceptionally fast process this far, historically fast. Um, even if, uh, and even more so, of course, if it's uh, if it's even if it drags on until the next year, even even then it will be historically fast. Uh, but then, of course, these are exceptional times. The two countries applied in May. They were invited to the summit in June, at the end of June, and before that, the membership action plan, the sort of the process within NATO, took only a day or two. Usually, the map process by itself takes years. And in some cases, cases, it has taken more than a decade from applications to be filed or the expressed interests to uh, become members to actually taking a seat at the table at the NAC, the North Atlantic Council. And I think that what the Secretary General, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, meant when he talked about the fast track process, as we might recall now. Uh, I think that was what he meant was the MAP process, the membership action plan. But it was a bit confusing because uh, to some it might have, uh, uh, it might have been inter interpreted by some as sort of, you know, we apply today and tomorrow we'll be members. And that's not how it works, of course, in NATO. This is round of ratification applications uh, by all 30 members. Um, but this round is actually uh, exceptional and unique in all the other ways, apart from this very fast process. And one uh, important aspect of, it, of this is that 
First of all, it wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't meant to happen. No one prior to the spring, no one anticipated or expected Sweden and Finland to join NATO in the foreseeable future. Not even in NATO or including in NATO. Uh, and definitely, uh, if there was another, if there was supposed to be another round of enlargement, it was so, certainly not to Sweden and Finland. It just wasn't in the cards. Both countries were perfectly happy with their non-aligned status uh, as close partners to, to NATO and as enhanced uh, partners, enhanced opportunities partners in this group of only six uh, partner countries. Um, Ukraine is another one. Um, and is sometimes referred to as the gold club. So Putin's plan that he presented at the end of last year has certainly backfired. As you remember, one of his points was that he demanded a stop from further, from, for, from further enlargement of NATO. Instead, he got Sweden and Finland as members or as member candidate countries, soon members. And the, of course, it's the Ukraine, the Russian attack on Ukraine changed all of that. Uh, and the realization, first in Finland, and then more slowly in Sweden, um, of the dire consequences of being outside, of not being protected by Article 5. Uh, and it also confirms the analysis of a book that I recently reviewed. Uh, it's a book on alliances by an author called Jason Davidson, where he says, and I quote, lesser states seek alliances when their fundamental survival is at stake. And that's exactly what happened. Also, and never before during the many rounds of enlargement, uh, three during the Cold War, five afterwards, has NATO been able to welcome two old democracies as new members to this alliance of democracies. And never before has um, NATO been able to welcome two new members with such a high level of military preparedness as Sweden and Finland. And this is, of course, particularly true for Finland, which easily meets the 2% requirement. Uh, and never cut down on, military as the, uh, on its military as Sweden and um, many other European countries did. And both militaries, Sweden and Finland, are highly sophisticated. Uh, top-notch technologies, capabilities, and a very high level of interoperability, that's a very difficult word, uh, with NATO after all these years with uh, partnership since 1994, as we heard. And both countries are seen as reliable security producers or providers, as is the term, uh, after multiple rounds of, of uh, participation on, in, in operations under NATO command from Bosnia to ISAF. And both have taken part in innumerable NATO exercises in the Baltic Sea and elsewhere. And they also both have been referred to as partners number one, Swedish, uh, Sweden and Finland both as partners number one. Um, so two highly sophisticated and qualified new members. But having said that, and this is my final comment, uh, they are newcomers to a club where all the other, the oldest members of this club, uh, the 12 founding members, have been, par, uh, have been members for 73 years. So they are newcomers, and uh, this calls for a dose of humility, as I, as I see, uh, as they take their seats around this ever-expanding uh, table at the NAC. Uh, and this especially applies to Sweden, uh, with its known for its high profile in international relations. Uh, and there's also a need to change the mindset uh, after all these years of non-alignment and which some still refer to as neutrality. Um, and they need to understand and learn how NATO really works. It's a big step from partner to, to member. It's crossing the street from um, the old headquarters where the partners are and the new one where the members are. Uh, so let me conclude just by quoting President Biden when he had put his signature to the um, US ratification of the Swedish, Swedish and Finnish membership applications in August, he said, and I quote again, when Finland and Sweden bring the number of allies to 32, we will be 
stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Sophie. We will come back to, to your chapter and your presentations in a while. Uh, but first, we will listen to Carlis. Please, would like to. Okay, you can speak from there. Does it work? Yes, yes it works. Thank you. Uh, my chapter is written, let's call it with military eyes from a Swedish perspective mainly. Although, of course, I mentioned the other countries and where they fit into the Nordic context in when it comes to NATO and when Sweden and Finland joins NATO. Uh, the areas that the cap, uh, chapter uh, covers is we need a new way of thinking. I elaborate a bit on that. The tasks or of the different Nordic countries within a NATO context. Sweden's role in this Nordic, if not mini NATO, but this Nordic constellation. Some words about command structures in the future when Sweden and Finland will join NATO, and also some words on burden sharing. If we are in the alliance together, we should share the burdens, but also pool resources. And I, I've written, uh, just illustrated some ways how we could pool resources in the Nordic or the Scandinavian, on the Scandinavian peninsula. If I go a bit deeper into some of the areas I have covered, then this a new way of thinking. We have so far, among uh, Finland and Sweden, we have mainly been thinking of defending our own territories. We have been thinking that way for uh, decades, in Sweden's case, 200 years. In Finland, since 1945 at least. And just to illustrate what I mean, that we have to think in another way, change our mindset. Look at the Baltic. From a Swedish point of view, the Baltic Sea has been a moat. And if Russia tries to cross the moat, we will do our best to prevent it. Sinking his ships, shooting down his planes or whatever. But now, the Baltic will now become a link to our Baltic neighbors and a link to Finland. And our main task when it concerns the Baltic is to keep sea lanes and air corridors open to our friends and allies on the other side of the uh, sea. It's a totally different way to think and plan compared with what we are used to. And it might sound as a joke, but it isn't a joke really, when it comes to changing our mindset. For Sweden especially, it's a question of starting to think how we thought in the 17th century. When our task or Sweden's task or the combined Sweden-Finland task was to defend a area or provinces on the other side of the Baltic Sea. Finland was a part of Sweden, and Sweden was somehow in those times a staging area and also generating resources to de uh, defend the provinces on the other side of the Baltic. The parallel is striking really when it comes to the way how we have to think. How did he plan? How did Gustavus, Gustavus Adolphus plan in the 17th century? How did he think? I don't know, but uh, we might have some historians here who could look into it. 
Secondly, uh, this Sweden and Finland joining NATO will create the need of new command structures in this part of the world. In my chapter, I mention perhaps we should reconsider F North, perhaps reestablish it, could be one solution among others. Then some people tell me that, no, 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 don't meddle in that. That's not your problem. And you are new members and you shouldn't have any thoughts about that. NATO, the old members will fix it. No, on the contrary. NATO is in a flux at the moment, re-establishing new headquarters in the Baltics, in Poland and other places. NATO is changing at the moment, going back to its old role, being able to fight a war. And I think it's a good opportunity really for us to present our ideas how the Nordic area is best defended. And we will discuss it, of course, with all other members in the alliance. Lastly, I do have a worry. I'm worried when it comes to Sweden and partly also Finland. Article 3, I suppose you know Article 3, where it's said that all countries in the alliance have to have the ability to defend themselves. Then we also have Article 5. And somehow I get the impression that in the debate, Article 3 is becoming a fig leaf for some people participating in the debate. And they use it to avoid Article 5 and the things, the obligations we take on in Article 5. I think we should be very observant when it comes to this <coughs> problem, Article 5 contra Article 3. Thank you. Thank you, Carlis. Coming back to you and the, <clears throat> the fig leaves a little bit later. Now it's time for, for um, giving the floor to Stefan Fors, please. Thank you very much. It was a privilege to write this chapter, although after 10 years in retirement, it required a whole lot of upgrading my knowledge of this field. Uh, nuclear policy in NATO, what to expect from Finland and Sweden is the headline of the chapter. <clears throat> this has been discussed in both Finland and Sweden the last few days. But my first question actually is, what are we talking about? And the answer is, we'll have to address what the nuclear umbrella, the extended deterrence actually means. The following question is, who provides extended deterrence? And the answer is the United States, which means in practice, the US Air Force. This has been the case since the early 1990s, but few observers have noticed this and the discussion, discussion goes on in old Cold War terms. We now have, yes, okay, um, I shan't forget United Kingdom. They also have a nuclear deterrent which, which is credible. We now have about a hundred B-61 bombs earmarked for NATO nuclear sharing in, in Europe. 
the significance is, I would claim, largely political, but they provide the basis for discussions in, in the high level group and, and the nuclear planning group, which actually is, is such a secretive group that nothing much is known about it. I studied these things for 40 years now and must say I, I know almost nothing of the NPG. But we learn. But obviously, a hundred bombs are clearly insufficient if you talk about military, credible military deterrence. At this moment, Russia has a, about a tenfold advantage in, in non-strategic nuclear weapons. And in this respect, these 100 bombs don't matter that much. I won't say they, they are mar marginal, but they don't matter much. What's clearly needed is, is other US national resources, which not are earmarked for, for NATO. The B-52 bombers, for instance, participated in, in the recent steadfast noon exercise, which took place a little more than a week ago. Of course, not with actual nuclear weapons, but with mock-ups. It's those who fear that Finnish national law would be infringed if B-52 bombers with this load came into Finnish airspace, they, they shouldn't worry. Um, So when when come to the conclusion of, of what NATO and, and the United States really need, at least the US Air Force does not need to deploy nuclear bombs in, in Finland or Sweden. It's in fact completely against US policy and doctrine, and particularly operational doctrine. Good friends with experience from the US Air Force say that there is no, no, no other thing that the US pilots and Air Force officers want to avoid more than uh, confront the Russians closely. So we don't need to fear the question of, of nuclear weapons deployed or stored in Finland or Sweden. We should rather look at the United Kingdom then. If, if the United States wants to deploy more nuclear weapons anywhere in Europe, I, my guess is that it, it's in the UK. So what can Finland and Sweden contribute to US NATO nuclear policy? Primarily it's a participation in the SNOWCAT program, which means support of nuclear operations with conventional air tactics, which gives a role to the Finnish Air Force, which it surely is able to respond to. Now, what else? Well, my final comment is that 
allied friends ask us to, to come up with something in the nuclear planning group. As new members, we can innocently ask to be informed of what NATO nuclear planning and doctrine actually are about. And the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe is reported to have said that what's the best way to end a meeting in Brussels? Start talking about nuclear. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefan. <clears throat> Coming back to the nuclear issue a little bit later. Now it's time for to give the floor to Teja Tilikainen, please. Thank you so much. Right. Just it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, this this chapter uh, made it possible for me to to get back to my old favorite topic, namely that Finland and Sweden look very similar, <coughs> but they are inherently, in terms of their political identities, uh, historical self understandings, so different. And then I tried to use this chapter to ask myself, uh, what does this mean when the two countries join NATO? How does the, how is this uh, kind? How are these differences reflected in their NATO policies? But of course, I had first to uh, kind of uh, make make visible the very obvious that the post Cold War security policies of Finland and Sweden have been have, have had very many similarities. They look very similar. These two countries have have uh, kind of approached uh, hand in hand, first joining the European Union and and then. Uh, becoming uh, enhanced partners of NATO and then uh, kind of achieving the uh, kind of uh, this this uh, kind of surprising change uh, at the same time joining joining NATO but uh, but but still uh, their security policy traditions and identities are, are different i try to explain how so Finland is a small state. It has a small state culture and, and, and identity. It uh, has this understanding of being exposed, borderland, borderland tradition. Finland between two uh, former big powers, first uh, Russia and, and Sweden, then between the east and west of the, of the Cold War, between uh, the Orthodox and, and Catholic uh, traditions. So, this borderland tradition and uh, is, 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 is a very strong part of Finland's security policy thinking. And it has led to certain characteristics in Finland's uh, security policy. That is uh, perhaps the leading characteristics is, is that of pragmatism. Pragmatism has meant different things in Finnish uh, security policy in different uh, historical epochs. Uh, perhaps the example that I would like to give here remind us all about the kind of fast change when Finland, uh, when it decided to join the European Union, uh, just in one parliamentary debate, decided to get rid of the neutrality. After uh, that year, I think it, it was 93, uh, it was simply ag agreed that, that the concept of neutrality, the term of neutrality did not appear in any security policy documents. It was uh, military non-alignment, but it was a simple as that in this country, which has this kind of when when there is a need, there has to be a change of policy. Going back to the small state the identity and uh, the tradition of being ex exposed, then one needs to be pragmatic and 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 uh, change its policy when there is a need. Another kind of consequence of of this this political heritage is that is the need of consensus in, in behind major political security policy decisions. There, there needs to be the backing of the whole political field uh, when major issues of security policy are at, at stake. And of course here the Swedish heritage is, is quite different. It does not share even if, if, if the kind of small state rhetoric to some extent is used. Sweden is not a, 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 a small state that doesn't share the same understanding, self-understanding of itself as a small state. 
it used to be a, 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 a great European power. Uh, and if, if there is one reflection of this, this historical identity, it's of course the Swedish position there throughout the, the, the post-war war, war, uh, years, Swedish self-understanding of itself as a moral superpower. It has had a global mission uh, to, to uh, make the whole world a, a better place to live in terms of peace, security, democracy. These elements are not uh, the same in the kind of Finnish tradition. But, the, the, but Sweden has, has uh, of course, the, the understanding of neutrality is very different from Sweden, in, in Sweden than in, than in Finland. In Finland, the kind of uh, neutrality afterwards, when one thinks it's a contested uh, uh, concept, not only a, a, a success story for Finland, whereas in Swedish thinking, neutrality has been is seen as a success story. It has kind of kept the country away from, from, from uh, conflicts and war for, for the two past centuries. So these the heritages are different and with different results in, in our uh, policies this year when, when the countries have approached NATO. In Finland, uh, the change was, was taken practically by, uh, by the population uh, overnight, uh, when uh, Russia started its war against Ukraine, there was an opinion poll going on, and that the results of that opinion poll were already uh, very clear from uh, a support level of, of 23% in, in uh, support of NATO accession, uh, the support jumped to, to, to levels more than 50%. So overnight, when it was needed, when then kind of there was the understanding that now the old security <clears throat> policy tools do not serve us anymore there needs we, we need to make this change and from there 50 percent uh, did public opinion developed to the level of 80 percent in, in in favor and more in favor of finland's nato accession in june meaning that 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 half of all the political parties con half of the constituencies of all the political parties were, were in favor of, of, of Finland's accession to NATO. In Sweden, of course, the political field was more divided. It was a, it was a partisan issue uh, where, where the, the, uh, one of the blocs was in favor of, of NATO accession, the other, other, other against. So there was a kind of this, the lack of this consensus tradition was, was quite obvious uh, and, and uh, with reflections in, in this spring's uh, talks and, 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 and processes. So my final question, I described these things in the chapter and then the, pose the final question about what does this mean once uh, the two countries have joined NATO? What kinds of policies will Finland and Sweden have as members of NATO and what are the differences there? And I, I'm a little bit provocative uh, as the chapter is very short. <laughs> uh, I, I am arguing there that um, Finland has will continue its small state kind of the, the small state identity will continue will will continue to affect Finland's policy as a member of NATO. So it is about kind of uh, trying to mediate, trying to make sure that NATO is capable of functioning, taking decisions. That is that will always be the key interest of, of Finland, as it is the key interest of Finland as a member of the European Union, rather than than promoting it, it its kind of strong national agenda to try to make sure that the European Union is capable of acting when there is a need. When, once, once this decision has been taken to join something bigger, then the kind of the identity will, 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 will change. And this will most likely be the, the case for Finland in, in, in NATO as well. Its relationship with the US it will be uh, something that is a little bit of a question mark. Uh, there, one of the most obvious differences uh, can can be pointed out. Swedish relationship with the U.S. has been kind of on a solid ground, uh, in my view, for for a long time. Whereas in Finland, it has been more of a controversial issue. Not anymore, but there is uh, the the background is is different. Uh, Finland will hardly uh, uh, try to try to seek a leadership position in in NATO leadership for Nordic Baltic region for instance whereas in in for sweden i think this it is more likely that some kind of a of a leadership will 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 be of of interest finland as it's 
as it has already been stated, will not look for any kind of uh, reservations uh, for its, its accession. Uh, that there was a period in our national debate where uh, references to nuclear, the placement of nuclear weapons or, or permanent bases in Finland was touched upon. But now it has been stated that this is not what we want. We join and then we'll see what our interests are. Whereas in Sweden, I, I, I sense that uh, the, these topics are, are kind of uh, more, more divisive of the political field. So, so, uh, so I will conclude that, uh, yes, good cooperation is what is to be expected between Finland and Sweden in, in NATO, but, but still uh, we might see reflections of the quite different political identities there as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Teja. Now we heard four presentations, four texts in this. It's not, we're used to talking about white books or green books. This is a black book, <laughs> more or less. And we also have four authors who are not present here today, Minna Olander, Andreas Östhagen, Patrick Oxen, and Robin Allers. But you have been, in a way, talking also on behalf of all the the, the authors. <clears throat> now, after hearing your presentations and before I have some questions for you, I would like to, you have heard the tones from two Nordic countries now, what are the results of the NATO jury, or at least the findings, Jörg? Can I go there? Yeah, of course. That's great, so I can hide a bit in this yes. Um that's not supposed to be a fifth presentation, so just to be very clear uh, on that. And as this is my, my second intervention now in Hannah Holman, following last year, I was inclined to say, I think, Hyve uh, Itapaiva. That should sound like good afternoon. Uh, so uh, just bear with me. And second, you just stole the point on the black book because I was a bit, um, let's say, shocked today when I saw the book and said, it's all black. But I can reassure you, it's not a black box for NATO, what is in there. So that's totally clear. Um, stronger together. And first of all, I really would like to say uh, congratulations to that kind of book, uh, to the presentations we have heard today, to the publishers, to the editors. And I had the privilege to be with you already uh, for lunchtime and to listen a bit uh, more in detail on a couple of issues. And that's just, I think, a timely and relevant book at this time, what we need really to understand better on where we are and where we should go uh, with both Finland and Sweden. Again, timely and relevant. It alludes to a lot of good questions, right questions. And to be very honest with you, we don't have uh, these questions, actually these answers to the questions either in NATO. Actually, I, I wished I had you in my co committee meetings and just talking with you because there's a lot of questions uh, simply that need to be raised and our Finnish and Swedish colleagues just sit to me, uh, right next to me as, as a chair. And that's just um, great. Stronger Together, it was mentioned already, um, this is essentially, I think, the reason why, obviously, Finland and Sweden uh, joined uh, the path for, for application to NATO. It's a unifying theme across all the essays, and the essays really, as I said, uh, raise the right points. And just to give you a couple of examples again, and I think some of them were raised in the beginning, it addresses really past, present, and of course, the future. And in, in terms of future, there's always a bit of unknown. We simply don't know it. And um, I really like what you said in, in terms of, let's see where national policies and how they evolve after uh, the membership. It includes nuclear aspects as well as conventional and hybrid threats are totally clear. And it focused clearly, and I think this is very obvious now, deterrence and defense, Article 5. And I'm sure we might come back to that a bit later uh, again. And of course, dialogue and engagement, because as you know, the strategic concept makes it very clear uh, that the three core tasks are simply stands, or there is no change in that um, as such. And it raises a lot of question on potential implications with regard to military um, plans, uh, with regard to capabilities and the consequences for capability development. And I think you rightly said today uh, with regards to where you came from in terms of territorial defense. And NATO is not about territorial defense. It's about 360 degree. It's about um, all members. So I think there's a lot of uh, stuff to discuss on that uh, latest when it comes to, to further uh, deliberations uh, in the committee work. And I think I will dwell upon a bit on tomorrow in my, my speech and my presentation. Uh, as we say, there are different things, whether you uh, just commit as a partner or whether you commit as a member, including the re responsibilities associated with that. 
of course we like and I, I i really can promise you if the sec gen were here himself talking on the arctic and the high north he would be even much more enthusiastic as i can ever be uh, because it's really dear to his heart for for good reasons but also we i think for many years now have recognized from many manifold perspectives how important it is to look into that and again it's not only that region is about the south the east the west whatsoever it's really looking around the clock and i think this is where nato really uh, stands today and needs to look at again when it comes to military capabilities and um uh, just to re reveal a bit of what i might say tomorrow as we speak more or less our nato teams are already here in finland and uh, next week in sweden to talk bilaterally already on capability development and what it could mean so i think uh, we are quite quite um, not ahead of the wave but i think we are in a fairly good shape just to allow what i would say is speedy and hopefully very smart integration into our processes and structures and to be honest with you again, um, yes, I'm from NATO, but I was not born in NATO, apart from being a German, having always been in NATO, at least for some time. Uh, there's a myriad of processes and, and structures you have to get used to, I would say. And uh, there's a long way to go. But um, the pragmatic approach, I think, is absolutely the right one. Just get on with it and do it. And the rest might come over time um, how to do that. Uh, my final comment is really on, on getting in those kind of discussion with you, uh, with the editors, uh, with us, more academic uh, scholarship approach. For us in an executive, uh, let's say, day in, day out work, it's absolutely vital and crucial to have that dialogue. Because actually you help us to make us better. You help us to have the right questions at the right time at hand and to think about that. And I think this is one of the biggest values um, of that book again as also others have in this case. But as you said, I think, at least to my knowledge, not a big one is the first one dealing with that one. But I think it really makes us think and helps us getting into uh, the right uh, direction. So I really encourage uh, you really to discuss overtly and I'm looking forward to that, including tomorrow. Maybe have, we have not that much time tomorrow for discussion, but at least uh, some uh, for today. So no jury, there is no jury in the end. Uh, the only thing I can say, we really would like to see Finland and Sweden as soon as possible in this alliance, full stop. And if I was asked normally, I would say uh, rather yesterday than tomorrow. But it takes uh, some time for many reasons. And my last bit is just saying thank you, which is a bit easier in Finnish, I think is kitos, right? right? Here we go. Uh, don't expect me for the third time to give my uh, presentation in Finnish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. Looking forward to your speech tomorrow at the real, the, the actual Hana, Hana thing. Now we have, I think we have about 15 minutes left. What does the jury at the back say about the clock? I think so. Yeah. So we have to cut, cut down, well, of course, prepared questions. We have to make it short, but, but still. And then if you have urgent questions from the audience, we're also trying to, to pick one or two of them in the end. First, I'd like to, to ask Anne-Sophie, you mentioned what you described uh, in a very good way, how the fin Finnish, uh, Finland and Sweden have been uh, good partners with NATO with the enhanced opportunities. And we have been members of the gold club. I think you called it that. When, <clears throat> of course, life and politics is, is live broadcasting afterwards things might might appear in another light than when when they really happen but if you look at the spring springtime and what the, uh, and the finnish swedish application processes wasn't there in fact after all uh, in the finnish and swedish joining nato as much drama as in the movement when a dash hound sits down ducks always happens to me now it's on yeah uh yes thank you stefan there was a lot of drama uh and for those of us who have argued in favor of sweden and finland joining nato for the past well many many years uh this was of course exciting and it was also uh it was a little bit of uh what did i say this was about to happen in the end um but it was also of course with a very tragic background in ukraine but the drama um 
as Deja said, I think uh, was more on the Swedish front than the Finnish, because you were very pragmatic. And by the way, I, I, I actually live and work in Copenhagen. And uh, I've always argued that, yes, the Nordic countries are very similar, but they're also very different. What is the similarity, for example, between a Finn and a Dane? <laughs> we don't understand each other in many ways. Uh, but uh, I think what, one thing that Finns and Danes have in common is the pragmatic approach to things. While in Sweden it was much more sort of ideological, it was um, uh, frustrating in a way, I think, but there was also great unity behind, uh, behind this uh, application in the end. Uh, but it has been, um, I think it has been a, a spring that we'll, we'll never forget <laughs> this spring. And uh, it was hard to believe what was happening before our eyes, I think, in many mm. ways, mm. because it was so fast. And it would have been so much better if this had been, and I'm now speaking for, about <clears throat> Sweden, if this had been, um, if this step had been taken much earlier. Mm. So we had we had, had um, a more sort of quiet and calm process. Uh, and a debate, and if we had been able to sort of uh, sort things out and and for things to take their time. Now it was very dramatic, as you say, and very sort of intensified. And I think that there will be also a little bit of backlash on that because there's still um, an opinion out there which is not um, in favor of this happening. and. Uh, and we see that from time to time that it pops up, you know, some comments about how uh, is this really the right thing to do? And we see it now with the Turkish issue, of course. Mm. So very dramatic. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and all, all this was, of course, enabled by political decisions, but behind the decisions were the, the public opinion. And you tell you refer to the public opinion, the rapid change in the public opinion in Finland. Just in some days it went over 50 percent. And you said that the decision actually was taken by the population. But then, of course, we have the politicians. Shouldn't be the other way around, that the politicians show the way and the population follows. No, it was the other way around, wasn't it? In Finland, uh, I think it was the other way around. Uh, but I, in a democracy, I don't think that <clears> this, <throat> this, because everyone, of course, expected it, it to go the other way around, at least in Finland. So, so that it would clearly be, as it was in, in the case of our EU membership, EMU membership, it would be the political elites showing the way and, and the kind of population uh, follows suit. But this, uh, I think, I, I would like to make a linkage between what happened with, between what happened in public opinion and the Finnish so-called NATO option. Because as you remember, for, for 10 years or so, we have been told, the public uh, has been told in Finland that there are no ideological constraints or hurdles for Finland's NATO accession. The political leadership didn't say it, but perhaps it could have said that there is simply no need in the current circumstances, <laughs> earlier circumstances. And then there, the option that was, was presented that, that when there is a change of environment, there might be a change of policy. And I think that's what, that's what the kind of public opinion now that they were one step ahead. They thought that they, they were interpreting the situation and, and, and arguing in their way that now there is a change of environment and, and the country has to react. So in, in, in a way, the public took the, the NATO op option into use and, and mm. did that be <laughs> earlier before the, the political elites reacted. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Changing the focus a little bit, uh, going to Carlis and your <clears throat> Your chapter, you say, and I now quote, Sweden and Finland's accession to NATO creates great potential for increasing the alliance deterrence in Northern Europe. Hopefully, national prestige and inter-service jealousy will not become obstacles that hinder new thinking and necessary adaptions to a changing security environment. End of quote. What will this prestige and this jealousy be about? more or less everything uh, but uh, just to take some small examples 
I've written the chapter that there will be a need for new NATO headquarters in different places. And I think everyone here, especially the politicians, can imagine the fight that will emanate when three, four countries start to haggle about where should F North be in cold source as earlier, or perhaps in Stockholm, why not in Helsinki? And uh, who should be the commander, a Finnish general, or a Norwegian, or should we, will we have to compromise to take a Brit? Uh, that's one part. Uh, equipment. I've written about, let's call it the common Nordic Air Force. Of course, all countries will still keep their air forces. But operationally, the four air forces should be used as one. Of course, they should. It's one common asset in the Nordic area. But how will we create, what will the basing structure be? Should we build bases for the F-35s? So there are quite special really F-35 bases compared with what we are used to. In Sweden, how much? I know that the Finnish Air Force wants to be able to base in Sweden. That's quite natural. Will the Norwegians be happy to pay for that? Will we be happy to pay for it? We have, we have our own uh, system, Saab uh, Yas-39. The Baltic Sea, everyone will agrees that the Baltic Sea keeping the sea lanes open, keeping the air corridors open, will be crucial for the defense of the Nordic Baltic area. But there will be five, six countries, seven countries involved, I think. Finland, three Baltic states, Sweden, Poland, and Germany. And to some extent also Germany. Uh, Denmark, sorry. Eight different countries will be involved in, let's call it, handling the Baltic Sea. Okay, I've suggested perhaps we should look at to reinvent Combaltap that we had once upon a time. Uh, NATO had, not we. But no, there will be many interesting discussions after we have joined NATO. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. <clears throat> that's good to know. I'm sure you're right. Uh, <clears throat> one brief question, Stefan, to you. <clears throat> you described in your presentation how the, the nuclear issue de facto is a non-issue, but still, yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> you, you described earlier on that how, how the, the, the so-called nuclear issue de facto is a non-issue right now. But still, we have this debate about it. Who, in whose interest is it to keep up the discussion about the nuclear issue? Is it just a, w a way to kill time before the membership is a fact? Well, that was a tricky one. I think that it's common e ignorance hmm. which has um, triggered this situation now. Most people in, in, in media, but also among observers <laughs> and politicians don't have any good understanding of, of nuclear issues at all. That's a fact. And uh, uh, research in this area has, has been down in our country too. That's one, one of the reasons that an, an old guy who should play with his grandchildren is asked to 
your comments. <laughs> but uh, I think that on the research side, um, those responsible understand and 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 we we are on the way up once again. Mm -hmm. But your question, uh, I guess I have to decline. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Maybe it's just a way to bring emotions to the debate, bringing the nuclear issue. And now let's get more emotional. Are there any questions from the audience? We still have some seconds, some minutes left. Yeah, please. I'll just speak very loudly. I, I think we can hear clearly. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, hi, my name is Matilda Hellström. Uh, I work at the International Department uh, of the Parliament of Finland, mainly with uh, Nordic issues. I have two questions relating to Nordic cooperation. The first one to Tenga Tiedekainen uh, about the references made to Nordic cooperation in the Finnish and Swedish debates. And looking at the differences, do you also see? Uh, a difference in the way uh, Nordic cooperation has been used as part of, of these debates this spring. And my second question is to Aunt Sophie Dahl, um, comparing the Nordic countries to other accession processes that have existed, because there is now an existing cooperation um, in defense matters, Nordefco, that exists already. And is, will this create um, a possibility? for a Nordic bloc in NATO or advance um, the chances of having this stronger Nordic bloc while at the same time taking in consideration the fact that, for example, the Norwegian Prime Minister, um, Jonas Lars Støre, has spoken against the idea of a Nordic bloc and has said that we shouldn't speak about a Nordic bloc in NATO. Uh, thank you. All right, please. I, I do think that in this environment where we are living with a uh, very dangerous confrontation that has emerged between Russia and, and the, uh, the, the rest of Europe, I would say, and also more globally, uh, Nordic cooperation will reach into a, a new level once Finland and, and, and Sweden uh, join NATO. There is, a, there is a need for that now. So I, I, I think there, what we will see is more cooperation than, than rivalry or competition. But it does not mean that, that the Nordic interests, even if I, I, I think there are a lot of common interests, there are uh, Finland and Sweden have joined or will join NATO because of Article 5. They had a lot already in the framework of their partnership. So, so it, it is very much about Article 5. The hybrid threats was mentioned, of course, they share a lot in, in terms of comprehensive security approach, total persuaded, uh, so they have a common heritage. So it, it, I think uh, they will kind of uh, throw aside their, their, the differences in this environment if, if, it's continue, if it continues. So, so, so this is, I want to kind of, uh, even if I spoke a lot about differences, I think uh, everyone now understands that these this this uh this these circumstances where we are living do not allow us to 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 kind of start compete competing with each other but your point uh, about nordic uh, cooperation playing a role in the accession process in the during this spring i think was very very correct i share that i think it was much it facilitated our uh, accession when uh, the three other Nordics uh, already are there, and this also means Nordic reunification within the uh, context of, of uh, NATO. I have even gone that far that I have said that uh, that the role of uh, of uh, Sekchen uh, Stoltenberg and that the fact that there has been a Nordic face in the leadership of NATO played a role, facilitating kind of uh, change of public opinion in. In, at least in, in, in Finland. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Uh, and I'm very happy to talk about Nordefco because I've been working on Nordefco, and uh, which is very interesting to do in Denmark, which has been quite uh, critical of Nordefco. And in Copenhagen, everyone, or at least those who work on these issues, are uh, they are very happy that 
Sweden and Finland will now join and that Nordefco will be for real, as they say. Uh, there won't be these uh, barriers, these, uh, these different um, restri restrictions that have stopped Sweden and Finland from participating all the way. There will be no NATO secrets, uh, for example. Uh, and it shouldn't be just uh, Nordic cooperation, defense cooperation, but it should extend, as has been suggested many times, to the Baltics. It should be Nordic-Baltic cooperation. Uh, but then again, it, um, uh, in a way, it's not going to be, uh, I mean, Nordefco is not going to be really the same kind of format as it was before, because it's with everyone in NATO, uh, it will sort of not cease to exist, but it will be a natural sort of convergence into something uh, more uh, relevant and more practical. Uh, about not creating a Nordic bloc, um, I think that the the northern countries will definitely, uh, the entire Nordic or northern area will be substantially strengthened uh, with this uh, these two new accessions. Um, but I, I, I think that it's a, it's an interesting comment by by the uh, Norwegian minister because Norway has now lately been been the, perhaps the most critical uh, country when it comes to uh, Nordefco. Um, but I, I think I, I haven't seen a statement, but I suppose that he might he might um, argue against. Uh, the creation of blocks in the sense that, as you said, it's 360 degrees NATO. Uh, we cannot just focus on our own area. We have to take the entire NATO area into account. Uh, so uh, the Baltic Sea, but also the Arctic, and we should also be prepared to uh, participate in operations and other things uh, in the South and take into account the uh, concerns, the security concerns of the South. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what he meant, but I think that it's important to understand that we, we cannot just isolate ourselves up here and, and uh, just uh, have a conversation among ourselves and defend ourselves. And this is something I, I think you <clears throat> mentioned, Carlis. Uh, there is still in Sweden a tendency to talk about the defense of Sweden. Uh, and that is one of the problems with uh, the, the mindset that I talked about and Carlis talked about, and that we need to understand that we now we're now going to defend the entire NATO area. Uh, so I, I, that might be what he what he meant. Thank you, Mon Sophie. Thank you, Carlis. Thank you, Stefan and Teja, Jörg, Gabriella. Thank you also uh, you who are present here and also those who are not present but somewhere in the virtual space for <clears throat> attending this seminar this was just a teaser we are running on extra time so we have to blow the final whistle but the real final will be played tomorrow at the hana tinget so stay tuned be there tomorrow thank you and have a good good evening thank you